Thanks very much for, for staying after the coffee break. Usually there's a mass exodus whenever there's a coffee break, but thanks for sticking around and for inviting me to speak. I don't know how many of you know of Inclodum, but we're, we're a specialist Scottish charity uh, founded in 2000 to work with those most vulnerable young people in Scotland. Um, young people generally who are seen as hard to reach, and we kind of switch that on its head and say actually generally it's the services that have been hard to reach for these young people and that they're crying out for that um, responsive support for the needs that they've got. So we work in a number of local authorities across Scotland um, and try to move as early intervention as we possibly can to prevent these complex needs from, from developing. And what I was asked to do was just um, sort of briefly take you through some of our practice model, but I wanted to do a little bit of audience participation before I do that. I'm seeing uh, blank looks from the audience. But what I want you to do is have a bit of a think about this picture, but with the people next to you, just very briefly, I want you to try and think about when you were seven years old, if you can remember back that far, um, what did you want to be when you grew up? So, simple question, hopefully you can all remember, but have a bit of a think. You can probably guess what I wanted to be when I was seven, what I wanted to be when I was 28. Uh, but have a think with, it, with your neighbours, what did you want to be when you grew up when you were seven years old? There wasn't complete silence, so that's a positive. Does anyone want to tell me what you want to be when you grew up when you were seven? I wanted to be a nun. A nun? Okay, we won't ask how that's worked out. Uh, any other? Anyone else? Can you can you all remember? I wanted to be an astronaut when I was I still do. I still hold out hope that there's a chance I could become an astronaut. Um, there was a great story, I don't know if you read the Herald, but the Herald Diary column is the only bit of the Herald that I actually properly read. But there was a great story about a, uh, a father who was helping his 16 year old with her homework and she got a text from the mother to say, um, what do you want from your life? And I thought it was quite a profound question to be texted, so they started thinking, is it, is it um, wisdom, is it wealth, is it love, is it all three? And they were thinking about this really profound question and they got another text, blaming a predictive text, and it was, what do you want from Lidl? Um, <laughs> anyway, I just, I mentioned that because it was in the hell, but I guess the point of me asking this is maybe quite obvious, but we all had aspirations and hopes and dreams when we were younger, and some of those dreams maybe came true, some of you maybe wanted to be in the exact job that you're in, some of those dreams didn't come true at all, mine hasn't yet, and that's, that's fine, we adapt, we change, we create new aspirations, we create new dreams for ourselves. For a lot of young people, um, they don't get that opportunity. And for the young people that we work with, one of the saddest things for us is actually that they have no aspirations because actually they can't see themselves in adulthood at all. The idea of them growing up into an adulthood with like those around them doesn't exist. That's an incredibly sad but important thing for us to think about. And part of the work that we do at Clodham is to try and get them to reimagine the idea of a future for themselves and to build up that self-confidence and, and um, try and understand the resilience that they already have so that they can have a future for themselves. And some of those goals and aspirations might be incredibly small things or they might be actually, I want to be on the moon by the time I'm 30 and we welcome all of those aspirations. But I think for all of us, um, living in a world where we don't have hopes for the future is a really sad and depressing place to be. So part of it is about building up those dreams for the future. Um, our starting point, again this is a really obvious thing, but when we uh, interview people for jobs with Inclodum, we kind of throw a curveball at the very first question is do you like young people? And based on their response we decide whether they're going to fit in with Inclodum or not, because it's a really basic question. But if you can't come out straight away and say yeah I like, I like young people and I believe in young people then you've not got a hope working with us, because that's so fundamental to everything. I think what was really interesting about Naomi's presentation was talking about this idea of a second chance. We think there should be a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, a sixth chance, a seventh chance, because we should never give up on, on young people. There's always a hope to, that we can turn things around. Um, and this is our kind of strap right here. Every chance is a strap on, but we support them when they need it most and we believe in them and we stick with them. I think the point I was making at the beginning about them being hard to reach or being seen as hard to reach is that actually quite often it's the services that are hard to reach, so we're there when they need us. So if that's 10 o'clock on a Friday night, we're there. We don't shut the door at 5 o'clock, because funnily enough, our lives don't come to an end at 5 o'clock on a Friday night and we carry on. And actually the moments of most crisis, the moments of most needs, usually aren't 9 to 3 during the school day, it's what goes on outside of that. Um, so, just talking a little bit about how young people come to work with us. They're referred to a number of different routes, social work or school or the courts or the police. 
And they all come with this really clear outcome. Most of the room probably work in this way of having outcomes. It's to reduce their offending and aim is to tick the box and off they go. But of course, in reality, that's not the, their whole life. There are all of these complex issues going on there. So they might have come to us because they're offending in their community or because they're at risk of being excluded from school. But actually, they're also living in households with mental health problems or trauma and loss in the family or experiencing financial pressures or a combination of these things. And quite often, uh, young people will come to us with five or more of these issues. And for a lot of them, going back to the aspiration thing, dealing with this day in, day out is absolutely overwhelming. So is it really any wonder that actually their hopes aren't much beyond that and actually turning up to school doesn't seem like much of a thing you should focus on? Actually, they start to think that because of all this stuff, there's not that much point in trying and there's people maybe not there to help them get through all of this. So again, it's about building up that self-esteem so that they can see there is a route out of this and there is a way to fix these issues. So just briefly uh, on our model, um, it's based on one-to-one -one professional relationships. I keep re I'll repeat relationships, I don't know how many times, because that's fundamental to everything that we do. Most of the young people who come to us, they either don't have any stable relationships at all, or the stable relationships that they do have are negative relationships. And part of it is about building up a positive relationship in their life so that there is someone there that they can rely on. Um, stickability is a, a phrase that I think we coined. If anyone else has a trademark on it, I'm happy to, to admit it might not be ours. But stickability is this idea that we will persist with them. And quite often it will be young people who will slam the door in our face the first three, four, five, six times we go to see them. And their assumption is, well, every other service has given up with me at that point, so I'll just keep doing it. So we keep um, going back and, and chapping the door and finding where they are and going to Grand's house and going down the street to find them. Because it is this idea we want them to know that someone is there looking after them. We're there at points of crisis, so not just when it suits us, but where it suits the young person where they need that help the most. And this idea of transitions is really important as well. So we'll provide one worker who's with the young person. There's a team around the child, but the idea is there's someone that they can rely on. There's a named person there that they know is their worker. Um, so there's not always professional adults in the life. There's one person that they know by name that they can rely on. So, and there's a continuity in that process. And I suppose, just to get down to the meat of it, that this is focused work. So we're not there to be their friend. It's a professional relationship that we build up so that we can then do focused work to move them towards a positive outcome. And that is sometimes challenging really head on the negative behaviours in their life, substance misuse, alcohol misuse, and um, risk taking behaviour. We'll challenge that head on, but from the point of view of having a relationship that they trust us. And as I said before, life would work nine to five, and it's a shame that most of our services do work nine to five, but we need to get out of that mold of, of thinking of things. So I want to take you through one young person's journey. This is a young person called Peter. And as I'm doing this, I'm going to ask you as the audience to tell me what you think. Now, there's no right or wrong answers. And although I'm being filmed, you're not being filmed. So you can be honest in, in what you say. And hopefully we'll get a bit of a conversation going. So Peter was 15 when he was referred to include him because he was repeatedly being excluded from school for fighting and other discipline issues. He had chronic non-attendance. And when he was at school, he was described as non-engaging and uncooperative. What do you think of Peter? <coughs> Can you shout out? Not very happy. First. He's not very happy. Not very happy? Okay. I think he's sad, not bad. Sad, not bad. That's good to put him. Clearly something was wrong. It's preventing him from wanting to do these things. Okay, it's clearly something wrong. And what do you think should happen to him next? I don't think it's the chance for that that he took the relationship. Okay, good. Those were good answers. Sometimes you do this and you get some very lecture answers. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you a bit more about Peter's story. So when we started to work with Peter, it took seven separate opportunities to go and engage him. So at seven times we went and chapped on the door and were refused any cooperation from him, but we went back seven times and eventually he gave up and decided to work with us. And then we discovered that he was the leader of a local gang, he was involved in a variety of negative behaviours in the community, he just hadn't come to, to police attention at that point, and he was misusing alcohol and drugs. So what do you think of Peter now? Still not very happy. Yeah. It's probably a bit overwhelmed by all the different parts of his life. 
and using the alcohol and drugs as his coping mechanism. Okay, good. So what we sometimes do when we, we do stories like this is if you imagine an iceberg and these are the two bits of the story that you know, it's worth saying this is the only bit that any of the professionals involved in Peter's life knew at that point. He wasn't involved in social work, he wasn't involved in the police. So this is all the still new when they use referred to us. We then started to find out these things and then this is Peter's full story. So he lived with his dad who had drug misuse issues and had been in prison for assault and a couple of weeks after he was referred to his dad passed away. He didn't live with his mum and he had a poor relationship with his mum when she had mental health problems. Uh, he self-harmed, he attempted suicide on a number of occasions. He had this perception that all authority was out to get him, so he had no respect for it at all, he didn't want to cooperate with it. And he had, it says little aspiration, he essentially had no aspiration. It, uh, Peter was one of these people who couldn't imagine himself as an adult. He was frozen in the moment that he was in. So this is what we then uh, started to work with when, when we discovered them. And if you imagine this iceberg, all of that stuff before is the bit above the water. And all of this was going on underneath that nobody knew about. And so again, is it any wonder that he was chronically not attending school, or when he was at school, he was behaving in the way that he was, because it was a, a communication form for him, it was a way of him expressing what was going on. This is, you won't be able to read all of this, but this is an exercise we do with young people. Um, several weeks after we built up the relationship, we'll then start to get into the focus work and ask them to tell us about their life. And we did it in a number of different ways. We worked with an eight-year-old in Dundee. Uh, last week I went up to see who had, it was related to Formula One, so he did his life story as a racetrack. This is um, uh, a lifeline here. You can see all the peaks and troughs and all of the complexity that goes in there. And the moments that they express has been really, really important in their life. And that's when you start to work out, actually, it was maybe grandpa passing away when they were five that, that had the biggest impact on them. Or in this case, it was mum hitting me with a pot at that point, which is the behaviour that went down. So all these things are a response to things that have been going on in their life. So just briefly, what, what include them actually did. So we consistently had to build a relationship. He had no positive relationships in his life at all. The one good relationship he had with his dad ended when his dad passed away. <coughs> he was left with very little. Um, we operate a 24 seven helpline, which isn't a, a kind of number you phone up to get advice. It's a number you phone up to get somebody to come out to see you. And there'll be around the clock actual physical response from our workers. Um, and so that at the point of crisis, at the point where he, we knew he was going to get involved in some of the negative behaviours, for example, on a Friday night, we would send someone out an hour before that to just spend some time with them and go over the, the goals that we'd set with them. Um, did some mediation between Peter and his mum, because we don't just work with the young person, we work with the whole family. And then with, with alcohol and drug misuse, it's working on those underlying um, risk factors, so we, we don't tell a young person you know, you need to stop drinking alcohol, partly because it's not going to work, but partly because it's not going to deal actually with the, the root causes that lead them into that behaviour. Um, and then building up a structure as well, so trying to put in place some sort of routine in his life um, and enforcing that. So we do a lot of work around unplanned contacts, so we'll plan time to work with the young person, but we'll also just turn up and make sure he was okay. And particularly in Peter's case, a lot of that was we turned up at half seven, eight o'clock in the morning to just make sure actually the routine of getting them up and to school was being embedded and we were helping the family to, to keep that in, in play. And then a, a key thing as well is a brokerage role with other services, so actually sharing what we can with services, but more than that just being there to support them. So when he went back to school, the school were given the helpline number. At the point where he started to disengage, they could phone the helpline and we would come in. So instead of the informal exclusion of sending them off to the head teacher's office, um, what happened was he got the support that he needed at that moment, so someone from Cleveland came in to support him in the school. So this is just a summary of uh, Peter's story there. Point of referral, chaotic, vulnerable, not attending school, nine months of, of intervention of, of roughly seven hours a week with four of these unplanned hours, moving towards attending school full time. But more importantly, I think these issues around uh, ability to deal with loss and conflict and the self-motivation and aspiration, those are the things that are going to be sustainable in the long term. So the key elements for Includum, uh, relationships are key, we all know that in this room I'm sure relationships are key to absolutely everything. Um, stickability of not giving up on young people, um, we give up on young people far too easily um, and they'll challenge us and they'll throw things back in our face but if we give up things are only really going to get worse. We have to keep going back again and again and again. 
Um, no young person is ever beyond help, so it's that 10th try, the 11th try, the 12th try to, to turn things around. We can absolutely succeed in doing that. And I'm, I'm not a huge fan of self-esteem, but um, this idea of capacity in an individual, um, most of them I was saying earlier on, you would be amazed meeting these young people, frankly, that they don't appreciate they've got that um, ability and that resilience in themselves, because the things they've been through, they are incredibly resilient to still be here, frankly. And it's about us unlocking that resilience into a useful way so, so that they have a positive future and this idea of the aspiration. Um, and each young person is an individual. So programmes work, but only if they are tailored to the individual young person. No, there is literally no one-size-fits-all solution, and if we go down that route, we're only going to end in poorer outcomes and more young people slipping through the net. And just to, to repeat the points we made at several points today, early intervention works at all stages. We can be preventative with a 15-year-old just as much as we can with uh, a newborn baby, and we need to kind of try and move that um, discussion about early years into the idea of early intervention at all stages. Um, so just really finally, um, key elements I suppose for, for the wider world, we have a, a, a real focus just now on this idea that attainment can only be raised if we focus on what goes on outside the school as much as what goes on in the school. The vast majority of, of the impact on young people's outcomes is out with the school gates. So if we only spend our time talking about school governance, we're not actually going to achieve the results that we want for young people. We need to focus on what goes on beyond three o'clock in building that capacity and resilience in, in families and um, looking beyond the school. Relationships matter and transitions matter as well. So some of the key points in young people's development are also the points at which we have quite poor transitions. The main one is still being primary school to secondary school, where all the relationships in their life suddenly change and they're left in a, a much bigger environment with, with very little support there. And I think we've got better at that, but there's an incredible amount we still need to do. I always like to finish with a Dr. Zeus quote, just to remember at the very beginning, my first slide was, we like young people. So for me, this one's really important. Unless we care a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. I know all of us in the room care an awful lot. Um, we just need to put a lot of what we've learned today into practice um, so that people like Peter can, can get the future that they deserve and the aspirations that they're all hoping for. Thank you very much.